In an open loop system, a control signal is sent to an actuator and it is assumed that the actuator will act in the requested way start, stop, reverse and so on. There is nothing to check that the actuator has in fact moved in the way that was intended. Open loop control is adequate in many common situations. For example, a controller for a washing machine stops and starts the drum motor and runs it at different speeds for set periods, but the exact number of revolutions made by the drum during these periods is of little interest and is not measured. Another situation where open loop control is feasible is one where there are only a limited number of possible outcomes, and an incorrect outcome is unlikely. For example, a solenoid either pulls a plunger to a final position or releases it to return it to its starting position. These are the only two possibilities, barring faults, these are the only two states that occur when a control signal switches the solenoid on or off. A more interesting case of open loop control is provided by the stepper motor. A stepper motor can be moved one step at a time from one position to another by applying a particular sequence of pulses to its windings. As long as the starting position is known, any position in either direction can be reached correctly by sending the right number of pulses. So in the case of the stepper motor, accurate positioning is possible with open loop control. With open loop control of a stepper motor, if the system has been switched off, there is no record of the motor's present position. So firstly, a starting point must be established. Closed loop systems. In contrast to open loop systems, closed loop systems measure the effects of actuation to see whether it is in fact as intended, and takes some corrective action if it is not. It thus closes the loop around the process from the sensing actuation by feeding the end result back to the sensors. So closed loops are also referred to as feedback loops. By using feedback, it is possible to build circuits with accurately defined gains and other parameters. It is interesting to note that these ideas are used not only with servo motors, but also in a wide variety of closed loop feedback control systems, such as control of heating and ventilation in buildings, and temperatures, pressures and flows in chemical plants and power stations. The purpose of the controller in a servo motor is to drive the motor so as to bring the measured value of its position to correspond with a desired value. There are different ways in which this can be achieved depending on the design of the controller. In the process control industry, the quantity being controlled is often referred to as the process variable, and the desired value is called the set point. The simplest type of controller switches the motor fully on or fully off, with no intermediate control of speed. The direction of rotation depends on whether the measured value is higher or lower than the desired value. When they are equal, the motor is switched off. Because the motor is switched from one extreme to the other, this is referred to as bang-bang control. This is a similar to the case of a central heating thermostat that simply switches the heating on or off, depending on whether the room temperature is below or above a certain value. Although bang-bang controllers have the advantage of simplicity, they do have some drawbacks. Since the motor is driven at full speed towards its target, when it arrives it is likely to overshoot because of the spinning motor's inertia. Once it has come to a halt, it will start up again at full power in the opposite direction, possibly overshooting the target again. In fact, it can happen that the motor never stops at the set point, but continues to move jerkily in alternate directions a condition known as hunting. Proportional control. We have established that the bang-bang controller, which aggressively approaches the target at full speed, is not necessarily the best solution. The controller can be improved by adopting strategies to vary the power to the motor continuously, in such a way that the target is reached both quickly and accurately. The proportional controller varies the motor power according to how far the measured value is from the desired value. The difference between the two values, desired minus measured, is called the error signal. The error signal is multiplied by a constant gain, and this determines the power to the motor. So when the motor is far from the target, it is driven with a higher power than when it is near the target. Thus, the motor moves rapidly for large errors and slows down as it gets nearer the target. The performance of a proportional controller depends on a large extent to selecting the right gain. If the gain is too low, then the power in the motor will be small, even with a large error. The target will be approached only slowly and may not be reached at all due to friction. On the other hand, if the gain is too high, the controller will act more like bang-bang controller, and possibly with excessive overshoot and oscillation around the final position. This diagram is of a proportional controller. The circular symbol with the plus sign is an adder. It adds the two input signals. 
However, the input with a minus sign beside it inverts the signal, so that the error signal at the output of the ladder is the difference rather than the sum of the inputs. Integral control. One potential problem with the proportional controller is that the motor torque is low for small errors, so that around the set point it is relatively easy for an external force to turn the motor away from the correct position, or for a frictional force to stop it from reaching the target. Accuracy in the final positioning can be improved by adding what is called integral control to the proportional controller. The idea of integral control is that it takes into account not only the size of the error, but also the time over which the error has existed. An integral signal is generated by multiplying the error signal by the time, and then by a constant gain. The integral signal is therefore cumulative, increasing as long as the error continues. If you are familiar with calculus, you will recognise the integral as the area under the error curve. As the integral signal grows, the effect is to gently push the system towards the desired value. So if the error does not reduce straight away, integral control gradually increases the motor power until it does. This figure shows a controller that combines the proportional and integral control, also known as a PI controller. The integral function is performed by a simple op-amp circuit known as an integrator. Derivative control. Integral control improves the final accuracy of positioning, but it does not reduce overshoot. In fact, increasing the gain in either proportional or integral control is likely to increase the amount of overshoot. Derivative control aims to reduce the tendency to overshoot and oscillate. It does this by responding not to the size of the error signal, but to the rate of change. So derivative control reacts to the speed of the motor rather than its position. You are probably familiar with the idea of mechanical damping from everyday examples such as doors that are designed to shut gently rather than slamming, and dampers or shock absorbers that smooth the ride in vehicles. Dampers provide little resistance to movement at low speeds, but resist strongly if fast movements are attempted. Derivative control performs a similar task by generating a control signal that opposes fast changes in position. This signal is the rate of change of the error multiplied by a constant gain. By adding derivative control to proportional control, overshoot and subsequent oscillation is resisted. However, it is possible to have too much of a good thing, and if the derivative gain is set too high, it can, in some circumstances, cause a system to become unstable. As with integral control, the derivative signal can be generated by a simple op-amp circuit. This circuit is called a differentiator. We hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction to PID control. For more information on PID control, please see the link in the description below, which will take you to a free download on our website. Our website contains many free downloads for instrument and control information that you may find useful. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.